Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so uh, the today's uh, topic is uh, rheumatological drugs in fertility, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. Uh, although it looks simple, uh, I chose this uh, topic uh, because uh, routinely we come across uh, patients frequently uh, who are on very simple drugs like hydroxychloroquine have been stopped and uh, withheld by uh, physicians, uh, medical officers and other specialties. And sometimes they even counsel the patient not to take certain drugs which are um, I mean, completely safe in uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding. Uh, so uh, let's move on to the lecture. So uh, this slide shows uh, the, the common drugs which we use and uh, they are safe in pregnancy and uh, breastfeeding uh, as well as paternal exposure. So the first drug is uh, steroids, uh, prednisolone and methylprednisolone. So uh, these are safe to continue in pregnancy because uh, most of the corticosteroids um, get metabolized in placenta and uh, only 10% reach the uh, fetus. So uh, out of all steroids, out of all steroids, uh, uh, the prednisolone is the recommended uh, drug. Did it take going? So uh, prednisolone is a recommended drug uh, because uh, of the you know uh, the side effect profile and uh, the potency compared to other drugs. Uh, there's not a big difference between the potency uh, compared with other uh, steroids. So, uh, and uh, the safety and uh, safety data, what is the available safety data, uh, is uh, shows a, a good um, outcome for prednisolone. And uh, when compared to methyl prednisolone, uh, it behaves similar to prednisolone. So, it is also considered uh, safe. And uh, then the commonest drug, hydroxychloroquine, is uh, safe in all trimesters and um, uh, restricting and pattern exposure. Sulfasalazine, azathioprine. Uh, cyclosporine, tracrolimus, IVIGs. All these drugs are safe to consider in patients' uh, very conception, uh, all, all three trimesters, this feeding and paternal exposure. So uh, here, um, cyclosporine and tracrolimus, uh, they are advised to monitor patients' blood pressure, renal function, uh, blood glucose, and uh, ideally the drug levels, which is, which is not available here. So, um, and uh, 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 and uh, IVIG, of course, uh, it's safe in all, all uh, three, uh, I mean, uh, uh, all three trimesters, uh, preconception, paternal exposure, and breastfeeding. So uh, then, uh, uh, although the methotrexate, lefunamide, MMF, they are not safe for, uh, uh, I mean, uh, maternal uh, uh, side, but it is uh, safe uh, from uh, paternal, uh, paternal side. So uh, as long as uh, you use uh, low dose methotrexate uh, and lefunamide MMF, uh, all three considered to be safe uh, in paternal exposure. Uh, I will uh, explain it a little bit later on. Uh, I mean, uh, in following slides. Uh, so um, out of the antimalarial drugs, HCQ is the drug of choice, and then sulfasalazine. Uh, when you you are using sulfasalazine, they are advising to uh, continue folate five milligram per day. Uh, supplements and um, uh, earlier they say like uh, the uh, in the previous guidelines there was an issue with the breastfeeding uh, while on sulfasalazine but now uh, in healthy full-term infant uh, the breastfeeding is considered to be safe and then uh, uh, in men uh, it could affect male fertility uh, there are evidence that uh, it could cause oligospermia reduce sperm motility and increase proportions of abnormal sperm. So uh, it could affect uh, male fertility, but um, uh, outcome is not uh, not a big difference. So um, uh, if you, uh, I mean, if you don't have any other options, you can still continue salicylazine in male patients as well who are expecting um, pregnancies. So uh, is that uh, so they although it is safe, uh, still they have uh, they are recommending to keep it uh, as low as two milligram or less per kg per day, and then uh, other two drugs, uh, I mean, cyclosporine and tacrolimus, uh, again uh, they are advising to keep lowest effective dose in pregnancy, and then uh, it could be given in preg uh, pregnant uh, breastfeeding as well. We should not discourage uh, breastfeeding. But uh, paternal exposure, there is limited evidence, but so far uh, it has not reported any 
um, harmful effect. So uh, still, uh, if you want to give, uh, if you don't have any other choices, still you can consider. So uh, I move on to biologics. First, I talk about TNF alpha inhibitors. So uh, actually, this uh, lecture I was I had uh, this this was a lecture I did in, did in uh, UK uh, based on 2016 guidelines. But uh, now they have updated. Last year they have updated a um, uh, few more uh, new things. So earlier uh, they were recommending only uh, to continue at the intensive adalimumab and infliximab. They recommended to stop um, at uh, 16 weeks. But now they are recommending all types of uh, TNF alpha inhibitors, pediconception, uh, T1, T2, breastfeeding, and paternal exposure. Uh, but then, uh, still, uh, we can continue uh, in T3 if we don't have any other options. Uh, so, the problem here is like uh, when you are giving biologics in third trimester, uh, because most of them are monoclonal antibodies, uh, they could cross the placenta and then they could uh, result in fetal uh, immune suppression. So uh, the main problem here is when we are administering live vaccines uh, after delivery. So uh, now uh, they have uh, now they have advised earlier to stop uh, at third trimester because uh, of this live vaccine issue. But now uh, the studies have shown that there is a, no no significant uh, difference. Uh, although I mean, uh, only issue arises when you give BCG vaccine and rotavirus uh, vaccination, which is um, considered very important in uh, UK because of the risk of intersusception. So uh, what they say is like now, um, if if you need to continue, you can continue, but then delay the uh, vaccines, I mean live vaccines by uh, six months. But then still, uh, if, if the patient is having low disease activity or in remission, uh, you could, if you could stop it and consider alternative options, that would be better. And then you can continue the normal vaccination uh, schedule. So, so far now, like earlier, they asked to stop infliximab at 16 weeks and other uh, TNF alphas um, at a, a third trimester. It's no longer recommended now. Uh, so... Uh, this is what I have already explained. Uh, so a delay is advised in administration of live vaccines of infants of these mothers. And then um, if you com consider um, uh, sertolizumab pegol, it's a very large molecule because the pegol molecule is large and it doesn't cross the placenta as a... Uh, uh, other uh, TNF alpha inhibitors. Therefore, if patient is already on uh, sertralizumab, uh, then you could continue. Um, uh, I mean, after delivery, you can continue the vaccination sh uh, sh uh, schedule as uh, uh, it is. So uh, earlier, what the re they recommended is uh, usually uh, when I was in UK also, I was like we, they used to stop. Uh, uh, other TNF alphas and sertralizumab was available, so convert to sertralizumab. But now it is no longer recommended. So, uh, uh, so no, uh, as I already mentioned, if there is no or low disease activity established on TNF alpha with known placenta transfer, like uh, in um, in um, infliximab, adalimumab, colimumab, they do not need to be switched to sertralizumab. And then uh, sertralizumab is compatible in all three trimesters, so you don't have to do any alterations in vaccination schedule. Uh, and then uh, if there is low disease uh, flare or withdrawal uh, on uh, withdrawal of uh, like, uh, you know, uh, TNF alpha in pregnancy, uh, if there is low disease activity or if there is no flare, you could stop. Uh, specifically, like um, uh, infliximab, you could stop at 20 weeks. Uh, adalimumab and golimumab, you can stop at 28 weeks. Etanacept at 32 weeks, if you think uh, it is necessary. And if you stop earlier, then you don't have to uh, alter uh, child's vaccination schedule. Um, so, uh, uh, these three, uh, these four drugs, methotrexate, leflunamide, MMF, and cyclophosphamide, uh, they are not considered safe, uh, pediconception, pregnancy, and breastfeeding. So um, on previous guideline, uh, they asked to stop MTX at uh, at least three months in advance, but now they are recommending to stop uh, just one month, uh, one, one, or, one or more month in advance. So, uh, and then leflunamide, um, they don't have data for breastfeeding, but if patient is on leflunamide, uh, I mean, it's ideal to stop periconceptual, but if they are on leflunamide, um, periconceptual or in unintended pregnancy, cholestyramine washout is recommended. MMF should be stopped in, uh, in uh, six weeks in advance. 
And then cyclophosphamide is not recommended in um, all three trimesters periconception, but uh, in exceptional circumstances, when there is uh, the maternal life is in real danger and mat maternal end organ complication, you could consider cyclophosphamide after discussing with, with the patient. Uh, on these circumstances, uh, uh, you have to discuss about termination of the pregnancy if appropriate. Uh, so uh, again, cyclophosphamide was not recommended on breastfeeding and paternal exposure. So, uh, you know, uh, the UK TIS, that is the uh, safety, uh, the, 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 the organization and the data on safety, drug safety uh, in UK. So they consider uh, methotrexate uh, risk in pregnancy to be dependent on its uh, dose. So high doses like uh, considered more than 25 milligram per week and low doses are 25 milligram or less per week. So uh, now, the, I mean, uh, in rheum rheumatological doses, uh, they are not uh, considering as high dose. So, uh, uh, so I mean, compared to the doses we use as chemotherapeutic agents or a body fashion. So therefore, uh, the the uh, all rheumatological uh, use of methotrexate comes, I mean, come under low dose category. So uh, when exposed to high dose in uh, I mean early pregnancy, then there is a risk of severe embryopathy. So like craniofacial defects, malformations of digits, uh, defects on of uh, spine and ribs in the fetus. So in these uh, in in these scenarios, you have to discuss with the patient about the termination of the pregnancy. So, however, um, uh, in, in contrast, uh, I mean, long-term exposure to lower doses uh, prior to conception, uh, you need uh, you need to do additional monitoring and uh, counseling because, uh, uh, I mean, there have been a lot of studies. Uh, they have not shown any, um, I mean, significant uh, worse outcome. So it's better to monitor uh, the pregnancy and then discuss with the patient and then uh, consider the uh, continue, I mean, discontinuation and the termination uh, after discussing with pa uh, patient. So uh, anyway, the take home message is uh, methotrexate at any dose should be avoided in pregnancy and stop at least one month in advance of planned conception because of this low dose concept that uh, they are now, now, now they are not uh, advising to stop in three months, uh, three months in advance. So at stopping at one month in advance is adequate, uh, I mean, uh, uh, from their point of view. Uh, so um, if patient is, uh, had been on low dose, that is 25 milligram or less within one month prior to conception, then we need to supply folic acid 5 milligram per day uh, up to 12 weeks of pregnancy. So, uh, and then uh, breastfeeding, a uh, very minute amount is uh, say excreted in breast, feed, breast milk. Uh, still, it is not uh, recommended because of the insufficient data. So, uh, as I have already, uh, I mean, explained, if there is, if patient is on low dose MTX prior to conception, uh, you have to give folic acid supplement. And then if patient becomes pregnant accidentally while on low dose MTX, stop immediately and continue folate and then evaluate fetal risk. So, leflunamide, uh, based again, the I mean, uh, the, uh, the evidence uh, data are very limited, but then uh, usually it doesn't show that it is a human teratogen, uh, but still it's not recommended in pregnancy. So, uh, if patient is planning a pregnancy uh, or if patient has got uh, pregnant accidentally, you have to consider polystyramine washout. And then we have to switch to a compatible drug. Uh, so, if washout given, no human evidence of increased congenital anomalies. Therefore, in accidental pregnancy, you stop washout until placenta, uh, plas sorry, plasma levels are undetectable. So, uh, but uh, the drug could be given in paternal exposure, although limited evidence available, it is not affecting the fertility. So, paternal exposure is fine. So uh, now I'll move on to uh, other biologics, uh, a few words about rituximab. So again, rituximab is not shown to be teratogen, teratogenic, uh, although we have limited evidence. But in second and third trimester, because it's a B cell depleter, neonatal, it could cross the placenta and cause neonatal B cell depletion. Therefore, uh, it is not recommended. And again, if patient had had uh, had become pregnant un unintentionally while on rituximab, uh, it is uh, not harmful. Uh, but paternal exposure is compatible. So uh, rituximab, they are suggesting to stop at least uh, six weeks uh, prior to 
uh, pregnancy. So, uh, and then, uh, sorry, six months prior to pregnancy. And then tocilizumab, uh, they are advising to stop at least three months before conception, uh, but, but still unintentional exposure in early T1, unlikely to be harmful. Uh, but breastfeeding and paternal exposure, there is no data. So if there is, uh, I mean, if there are no other alternative options available, uh, we could still consider tocilizumab. So, uh, then uh, moving on to uh, drugs like Anakinra, Abatacept, Belimumab, uh, then uh, still unintentional exposure in T1 is unlikely to be harmful because all these biologics, the data is limited. Therefore, uh, they have not found any teratogenic effects, but still uh, there, are, there are no data in breastfeeding and paternal exposure. So there are no alternative options still you can consider. So uh, these biological demands are still because of the you know limited data, they are still considering as unsafe. Therefore, uh, they uh, consider stopping at conception. Those are like uh, rituximab, IL-6 inhibitors like uh, tocilizumab, sarilumab, IL-1 inhibitors like anakinra, uh, abatacept, IL-17 inhibitors like secupinumab, ixitizumab, and IL-12 and 23 inhibitor like astakinumab and other drugs. So these drugs uh, better to consider stopping at conception, but if there is severe disease in all three trimesters, if there are no alternatives, we could consider because the data availability is limited and so far it has not shown any teratogenic effect. Uh, but still, we can continue in breastfeeding and paternal exposure. So, uh, how about the targeted synthetic demands? Those are JAK inhibitors like paracetinib, filgotinib, opatacitinib, tofacitinib. So, all, all, all four drugs, had, they have requested to stop at least two weeks or more preconception. And then it is not recommended in all three trimesters and breastfeeding, but paternal exposure, yes. Okay, so uh, that covers uh, the rheumatological specific drugs. Then how about other common drugs we use in pregnancy? So uh, these are uh, safe drugs in periconception, all three trimesters, breastfeeding, paternal exposure. So those are paracetamol, uh, codeine, codeine, uh, when using in breastfeeding, you have to be cautious because of the, you know, uh, respiratory depression uh, and other side effects on uh, neonate. Uh, tramadol, amitriptyline, low-dose aspirin, low-molecular weight heparin, uh, nifidipine in all three trimesters. Uh, although this slide says it's less than 60, it was according to the previous guideline. Now the they have updated, uh, you can even continue up to 90. So uh, this, those should be less than 90 per day. So uh, I would also like to add amlodipine to this slide because uh, previous um, in previous guideline, uh, amlodipine was considered as unsafe because of the limited data, but now they are, uh, um, I mean, suggesting that they say they could, we could continue, um, I mean, consider in this, uh, uh, and it seems to be safe, although uh, limited data available on breastfeeding, uh, paternal exposure, and uh, last trimester. So, uh, and then uh, SSRIs, uh, so uh, preconception, all three trimesters, paternal exposure, venlafaxine, fluoxetine, paroxetine, sertraline, and also duloxetine, they are considered uh, safe, but breastfeeding, uh, there is no data, therefore uh, usage, usage should be with caution. Uh, and uh, as I have already seen, uh, consider, I have mentioned, all SSRIs are compatible with pregnancy. So uh, the, the importance of uh, knowing this is uh, cessation of antidepressant therapy in postnatal period is not recommended because of the postnatal uh, blues and depression. So you can consider the, uh, continue those drugs. And then although the paracetamol is uh, safe, uh, intermittent use is advised. There's a small risk of wheeze and childhood asthma with prolonged use of use in pregnancy. So uh, there are there is very, I mean, um, small scale studies, but uh, still they have advised to uh, limit, uh, limit, I mean, uh, um, avoid regular use. Uh, like within uh, 8 to 14 weeks, there's a small reported risk of crypto cryptochidism. So, uh, and then codeine and tramadol, uh, it could be, uh, it is safe in pregnancy, but uh, consider uh, using uh, it in, with caution in uh, breastfeeding, uh, like because of the CNS depression resulting in unpredictable metabolism of codeine uh, to morphine. So the short term, these two uh, drugs um, use is advised to, uh, to limit uh, short term. 
So uh, these drugs, um, earlier it was considered uh, not safe, but uh, there are few changes for pregabrily and gabapentin. Uh, although the data is limited, uh, now they are advising if patient is suffering from a chronic pain uh, and you don't have any other alternatives, uh, still it could be considered uh, in pregnancy, continued in pregnancy, because uh, if you don't have any other alternative options. Uh, but uh, um, the studies haven't shown any teratogenic effect so far. So you have to use with caution. Uh, maybe we can uh, limit the dose. Uh, but then, uh, anti, um, I mean, anti-inflammatories, COX-2 inhibitors, uh, um, they are not recommended in periconception, pregnancy, breastfeeding, and pat uh, paternal exposure because COX-2 inhibitor, uh, paternal exposure may be fine because, uh, I mean, there are no data. So con continuing uh, COX-2 inhibitors in paternal exposure may be fine. So warfarin is not recommended in all um, all uh, pregnant periconception and pregnancy, but then breastfeeding, yes. Uh, and uh, paternal exposure, that's fine. So amlodipine, uh, as I told, I, I mentioned earlier, amlodipine should not come to this uh, slide. It should go to the previous slide because it is now considered safe in all, all four categories, uh, but then uh, limited limited uh, evidence. So, and then now oral uh, anticoagulant, uh, anticoagulants like rivaroxaban, dabigatran, uh, they, are, they are saying, uh, I mean, they say to avoid uh, periconception pregnancy, uh, breastfeeding, um, and, ex and even paternal exposure, except rivaroxaban. Rivaroxaban is considered to be uh, safe in paternal exposure. So, bisphosphonates, like alendronate, um, solindronic acid, and residronate, uh, stop three months in advance. Um, however, breastfeeding and paternal exposure, the data is very limited. So how about anti NSAIDs? So periconception, breastfeeding, paternal exposure, yes, you can continue. But in first trimester, uh, you have to, uh, if you want to give, you have to be very cautious because of the uh, possible association with miscarriage and malformation. But in third trimester, at least stop by 32 weeks. Uh, now it, they have reduced the time to 30 weeks. So at least 30 weeks uh, because of the risk of premature closure of ductus arteriosus. So AC inhibitors, uh, not recommended in pre preconception and pregnancy. So uh, stop when pregnancy is confirmed. Um, and uh, breastfeeding, uh, yes, you can continue. Paternal exposure, although limited data is available, if, if indicated, you can still consider. So how about, uh, you know, um, vasodilators, uh, sildenafil, bosantan, and postocyclines. Uh, then uh, they are not recommending the routine use uh, in periconception, uh, you know, all three trimesters, but then uh, breastfeeding and paternal exposure, although limited data available still, uh, they, if, if there is no alternatives, you can still consider. But then if you need to give it in pregnancy and periconception, uh, it should be uh, through, a, through an MDT uh, assessment. Uh, so, um, uh, since, since pulmonary hypertension is it's already is a contraindication for pregnancy, uh, so most of the time uh, we always come across accidental pregnancies. So uh, here we have to uh, discuss with other uh, specialities and and uh, uh, go for the favor of favor of the uh, go for a favorable outcome. So, uh, however, there is uh, limited evidence as to support treatment in pregnancy. Uh, thank you. So I would like to thank uh, the president uh, and uh, members of our college for giving me such a, um, I mean, wonderful opportunity. And thanks for the audience for listening patiently. Thank you. Thank you very much, Farah, for that very informative, detailed lecture. It was very nicely delivered. Any questions from the audience? Uh, actually, madam, I, I couldn't come across any dose limitation. Uh, it uh, seems to be like uh, they say it's safe, uh, but then I need to check up. Like, uh, there was a large uh, paragraph on hydroxychloroquine alone, but then I just went through, but uh, I couldn't remember seeing any dose limitation. I would check it out. Yeah. No.
No, they are they are not uh, mentioning anything anything about the preferred. Uh, they say it is like uh, as I have already mentioned uh, to stop all and all and intermediaries. Costing is not recommended at all. Other you know non-selective ones. Uh, you you can consider. Uh, I mean, low doses at uh, preconception, uh, T1, T2, but third trimester, uh, we uh, I mean, need to stop. Yeah, diphosinac is safe, but uh, I, other other options, they have not uh, specifically mentioned uh, not to uh, consider other options. So, I think now uh, our patients were on immune suppressants. They are not always having a long term stable disease, sometimes they care. So, you have to advise and counsel to plan their pregnancy always. Yeah. That is the best uh, plan. Yes. So, thank you very much, Carl. So, next lecture uh, a case discussion done by Dr. Diamond Kulik about a man with multiple ancestors. Thank you, madam, and good afternoon, all of you. Uh, I'm Dr. Jayamal, Senior Registrar in Rheumatology and Rehabilitation attached to NHSL. So today I'm going to discuss an unusual course of recurrent and multiple abscesses in a young man. So let me start with the case history. Our patient is Ms. Tess. He's 39-year-old father of uh, one child. So his test start five months before the current presentation. So he was in his usual state of health five months back when he first noticed an abscess in his left arm. So it, he attributed it to a scratch on his hand uh, by a cat. Uh, initially, uh, he received oral antibiotics by a GP. However, due to poor resolution, he had to undergo incision and drainage of this abscess. So about one month after this initial abscess, uh, he was, uh, for one month, he was asymptomatic. One month later, he noticed a painful left axillary lump. So it was associated with low-grade fever with chills and rigors. Uh, initially, uh, he has taken oral antibiotics, but uh, he persistently had fever with poor response to antibiotic for about three weeks. Then uh, he was evaluated as an inpatient in private sector. And while evaluation, uh, he was found to have left axillary abscess. So he underwent aspiration of this abscess and uh, with, after aspiration also, he continued to have fever. So uh, he underwent uh, incision and drainage at last and treated with IV antibiotics, including IV ciproxine and clindamycin. However, even after incision and drainage, as you all can see in the picture, he continued to have pus discharge from the IND site uh, in the left axillary abscess. So two weeks after this uh, left axillary abscess, uh, he developed fever with left-sided groin pain uh, associated with left-sided upper abdominal pain. Uh, the, this time also he was evaluated um, as involved in private sector and uh, while evaluation found to have a splenic abscess this time and left-sided inguinal lymphadenoma. So he underwent ultrasound-guided aspiration and was treated with IV antibiotics including IV meropenem, IV ticoplanin and linozolid also. So over next month, he developed multiple skin abscesses, which re needed uh, treatment with IV as well as oral antibiotics, and underwent incision and drainage several times. So over next two weeks period, that is exactly two weeks prior to the current presentation, uh, he developed painful abscess-like ulcers in the buccal mucosa, and also he reported on painful erythematous nodular and ulcerative lesions over his bilateral shins. He also reported on uh, polyarthralgia, and he had high-grade fever with chills and rigors as well. So apart from this history, over past five months duration up until current presentation, he complained of unintentional weight loss of 10 kilos with loss of appetite. So those are the positive things in the history. Apart from that, uh, he had no history of recurrent infections, including recurrent childhood infections. Uh, nothing to suggest tuberculosis, no contact history, and no risk factors for infective endocarditis. However, he gave a history of uh, unprotected uh, sexual encounters and no frequent exposure to wet soil or muddy contaminated water. Uh, and also no acute symptoms, genital ulcers, no neurological features, 
no history of any thrombotic events or during previous uh, hospital admissions, uh, there is no history of any abscess formation at cannula site or injection site as well. Bowel habits normal, no significant travel history, no significant contact history of with uh, animals except for initial uh, scratch by a cat. And past medical history, he's a patient with beta cell thalassemia trait, and uh, he was uh, diagnosed with um, grade one testicular seminoma five years before the current presentation and had undergone uh, orchidectomy followed by carboplatin therapy. However, um, follow-up imaging um, was normal and there's no evidence of meta metastasis or recurrence. So past surgical history unremarkable except for uh, orchidectomy. Uh, so rest of the history, nothing significant, drug history, allergic history, not significant, uh, family history, no family history of similar disorders. Um, so uh, if I am to summarize the history up until now, so five months before the current presentation, he initially developed left thumb abscess. So about one month after that, he was asymptomatic. So then uh, at one, one month after, he developed uh, left axillary abscess with fever. That episode lasted for about six weeks, one and a half months. So after IND for about two weeks, he say febrile. Then again, he developed splenic abscess with fever. So again, over next month, he developed multiple skin abscesses with fever. So two weeks prior to the current presentation, aptus ulcers, polyarthralgia, painful shin nodules and uh, uh, ulcers as well as fever. So on examination, uh, general examination, uh, he was ill looking and he was febrile. He was not pale or icteric. He had uh, no red dye. However, uh, he had uh, multiple oral ulcers, as you all can see in these pictures. In uh, yeah. one picture shows he is showing the one such uh, ulcer in the mucosa of the upper lip, and there's a palatal ulcer as well. And uh, also on general examination, he had multiple skin abscesses, as shown in this picture. It initially start as a red tend area. Then by day two, day three, the erythema increases, then it becomes a pus tube, then it ruptures with pus discharge. So apart from that, uh, apart from the skin abscesses, he also had abscesses uh, in his nail beds as well. I'm not sure that is clear or not. Here he's showing a nail bed abscess. So uh, these are the not chin nodules and ulcers he had. So he had erythema nodosum on his chin. And also these ulcerative um, lesions are pustular pyogloma gangliosum, which was uh, later confirmed after ophthalmology opinion and biopsy. So apart from that, uh, on the general examination, he had left axillary as well as left uh, inguinal lymphadenopathy. And also, uh, importantly, he had no genital ulcers. So rest of the systemic um, examination, cardiovascular examination, uh, nothing significant. Respiratory examination revealed left-sided mild pleural effusion. Uh, examination of the abdomen, the tip of the spleen is palpable. And uh, musculoskeletal examination, he had uh, diffuse uh, tenderness in uh, large joints. Apart from that, there's no active cyanomatis or any effusions. Genital examinations, no genital ulcers. So summary, uh, here we have a 39-year-old male presented with fever with uh, multiple abscess formation with left axillary abscess and splenic abscess as well, with weight loss for past five months duration. And he also had large joint polyarthralgia for past two weeks. Examination revealed the patient was febrile with multiple abscess ulcers in the oral cavity, left axillary and left inguinal lymphadenopathy, multiple skin abscesses, erythema nodosum and pustular pyoderma gangliosum like lesions on his bilateral shins, with palpable tip of the spleen with left-sided mild pleural effusion. So uh, at this point, what are the differential diagnoses we have to consider? Uh, at this point, obviously fever and recurrent um, abscesses, including skin abscess and deep-seated abscess, raise the possibility of an underlying infection. So here I, I have listed only few. Uh, those are infective endocarditis, TB and atypical mycobacterial infection, melioidosis, scratch disease, retroviral infection, and fungal infections. So apart, the, apart from the these, um, differential diagnosis, there are so many other atypical infections which can present in a similar way with lymphocutaneous involvement. So you have to consider those as well. So we, with the, uh, these differential diagnosis in mind, we'll move on to these investigations. So 
as you all can see, in full blood count, he had neutrophil leukocytosis with a WBC count of 17,000. He had uh, microcytic anemia, probably due to uh, already non taltrate and platelets with the higher side. Uh, here I'm presenting his past uh, full blood count values for you to compare. All those done in private sector all showed uh, neutrophil leukocytosis. So during current admission, CRP is 228, ESR 72, and procalcitonin towards the lower side, that is lower risk for progression to severe systemic sepsis. And uh, throughout the evaluation of past five months also, inflammatory markers towards the higher side with high CRP and high ESR. So blood picture during current admission, um, features of that of a bacterial infection, no abnormal cells, and uh, LDL normal, coagulation profile normal, except for fibrinogen, which could be elevated as a um, acute phase reactant. So liver profile, um, we noted some abnormalities, there's reverse albumin and globulin ratio, and uh, alanine transaminase level and uh, alkaline phosphatase level with gamma GT level, uh, there was elevation. So renal functions normal and serum electrolytes normal, uh, including serum calcium that is also within the normal range, CPK normal. So here I'm presenting his investigation findings. Uh, ultrasound scan of the left axle actually done uh, four months back while evaluating in the private sector that confirm a thick wall collection in the left axilla, probably a superiorative lymph node. So uh, ultrasound during current admission, ultrasound scan of the left groin and thigh, Necrotic left inguinal lymph node with uh, surrounding inflammation and ultrasound abdomen uh, revealed a splenic capsules. Uh, there were no parotid lymph nodes, no hepatomegaly or hepatic lesions. So here he underwent a um, CCT chest abdomen and pelvis as well. So that shows, uh, as you all can see in the white arrow, uh, the splenic capsules, which confirm a subscapsular uh, splenic capsules. Uh, and also, uh, it showed the left-sided pleural effusion as well, and uh, there was inflammatory left inguinal and left axillary lymphadenopathy. Uh, however, uh, there were no hyaluronic lymphadenopathy or parabiotic lymphadenopathy. So, moving on to microbiological investigations, pus aspirate uh, from the initial left axillary abscess, AFB not seen, pyogenic cultures negative. Uh, and he, he has already undergone uh, left. Uh, Accelerated lymph node biopsy while doing the IND in private sector. The report was available on admission. That showed suppuration surrounded by granulation tissue. And uh, remaining lymph node tissue shows follicular hyperplasia and sinus cystocytosis. And uh, there were no evidence of any specific infections. So they have given the conclusion as suppurative lymphinitis with evidence of organization. So splenic capsis aspirate, uh, acid fast bacilli not seen. TBPCR um, not detected, pyogenic cultures negative, fungal direct microscopy and cultures negative. So he underwent aspiration of left sided pleural effusion as well. So cytological examination revealed a heavy neutrophilic infiltrate. Uh, all the invest uh, microbiological investigations, bacterial, uh, mycobacterial, fungal, and TB gene expert, all those things were negative. So blood cultures repeatedly negative. 2D echo and uh, toe done here. Uh, there was no evidence of infective endocarditis. Uh, pus aspirate from nail bed abscesses and skin abscesses. Uh, bacterial cultures, fungal cultures, and uh, investigations for TB or negative. UFR normal, urine cultures normal, COVID-19 rat negative. Mediodosis antibodies done twice negative. So rest of the other... Uh, common infections we have screened, all those investigations were no, uh, negative, including retroviral skin, hepatitis screen, uh, brucella toxoplasma, CMUC illogy, and MARN2, and MRSC screen also negative. So uh, he had underwent some of the investigations for uh, some of the rheumatological diseases as well. Serum uh, angiotensin converting enzyme level normal, ANA negative, CNCA, PNCA negative, pathology test negative, uh, HLA B51 negative, rheumatoid factor negative, uh, alpha fetal protein and beta HCG done because of the history of testicular seminoma. Those things also within the normal limits and importantly fasting blood sugar normal. So following admission to medical ward, uh, while evaluating, he was started on IV meropenem and IV ticoplanin after taking a cult, uh, samples for appropriate cultures and dermatology opinion also taken. 
biopsy is taken from uh, erythema nodosum and pyogram granulosum like lesions that actually later confirm uh, ulcerated lesions with dermal neutrophilic microabscesses with paniculitis compound. So, despite being on antibiotics and thorough evaluation, he continued to have fever with ongoing abscess formation uh, with persistently negative infectious screen. And uh, so at this point, it was decided to have a multidisciplinary team discussion by the medical team. So with the participation of uh, dermatology team, rheumatology team, microbiology team. So uh, uh, following initial in CP pulses, we started the patient, saw patient on uh, oral uh, prednisolone, one milligram per kg dose. And on the first day of uh, oral prednisolone, we started uh, oral colchicine as well, 0.5 milligrams BD with oral prednisolone therapy. So one week after initiating therapy, inflammatory markers completely normalized and all uh, skin ulcers, oral ulcers, uh, and skin abscesses uh, and other cutaneous manifestation resolved and his liver profile become normal. And uh, one month later, there was complete resolution of his left-sided pleural effusion and shrinking of his splenic capsules. And there, were, there was no fever or new abscess formation. And three months later, there was complete resolution of his splenic capsules. So what are autoinflammatory diseases? Autoinflammatory diseases reflect uh, defects in the in innate immunity. So inflammation arises primarily through antigen independent hyperactivation of immune pathways. There are two main mechanisms. Either there's loss of function mutation in the genes that suppress inflammation, or either gain of function mutation in the genes that propagate inflammation. So uh, these mechanisms uh, can lead to um, activation of immune system either spontaneously or with minimal triggering, such as with infections and vaccinations also. And recently also with the recent COVID pandemic and immunizations, uh, these autoinflammatory diseases are largely uh, described. And uh, this autoinflammatory disease reflects only one axis of immune dysfunctions, which can lead to human diseases. So, autoinflammatory diseases are mainly due to defects in the innate immunity, that is, your phagocytes, complements, um, antimicrobial molecules, and signal recognizing molecules. So, there's primarily there's no antigen antibody interaction, so, inflammation is largely antigen independent. So in contrast, autoimmunity or allergy, uh, they are the defects in uh, adaptive immunity, that is your B cells, T cells, and um, antibodies. So inflammation is antigen dependent. So apart from that, the other arm of um, immune dysfunction lead to immune diseases is uh, immune deficiency. So uh, when we have a patient with difficult diagnosis like this with uh, atypical clinical features not fitting to common um, uh, DDs, we always consider autoimmunity and immune deficiency, but even though rare, it is important to consider autoinflammation as well. So there are so many uh, monogenic autoinflammatory diseases. I will not go into detail. The main category is related to the main aspects of um, innate immunity, such as uh, insomopathies and disorders of IL-1 and uh, interferonopathies, disorders of uh, T, uh, nuclear factor kappa B and uh, TNF activity and so on. So uh, here, uh, there's this new concept. In this uh, picture, these circles in the center indicate the main categories of autoinflammatory diseases. So in the surrounding area, some of the well-known and common diseases are there, including uh, autoimmune diseases. So it has been shown that uh, even though we primarily describe uh, autoinflammatory diseases are problems in innate immunity, and autoimmune diseases are problems in acquired immunity. Uh, they have a considerable overlap with regard to their pathophysiological mechanisms. So the diseases in the surrounding area also thought to be uh, related to from pathophysiological mechanisms so it's related to autoinflammatory diseases. So the surrounding area is called autoinflammatory penumbra. So since there are so many autoinflammatory diseases, it's important to suspect autoinflammation in your DEDs, especially when they have persistent fevers, unexplained multisystem involvement, especially the cutaneous involvement. And pattern recognition in um, autoinflammatory diseases is very important. For that, uh, early referral to uh, expert consultation is important. 
and appropriate testing. Most of them are not available in Sri Lanka, mostly genetic testing, and they need uh, special treatment. So coming back to our patient, uh, so what is aseptic abscess syndrome? So it's a multifactorial auto-inflammatory disease involving neutrophils. So uh, it is characterized by multiple recurrent neutrophil rich sterile abscesses. First cases described in 1990s, but after that in 2007, um, the term aseptic abscess syndrome was proposed by the authors um, uh, after comprehensive uh, description of clinical laboratory and radiological characteristic of similar uh, patients with aseptic abscesses from French aseptic abscess registry. So since then, uh, multiple, uh, several uh, case reports and case series have been published describing this new disease entity, describing the unusual location of abscesses, various disease associations, as well as uh, various treatment modalities used in the management. So this is one such uh, case series published uh, last year by the same uh, French study group on aseptic abscesses. So what are the criteria they consider to classify this patient into a uh, aseptic abs, uh, abscess syndrome. There's no established diagnostic criteria. These are the criteria they use uh, uh, when considering patients for these studies. Presence of deep abscesses on imaging. And uh, if puncture is performed, uh, there should be a neutrophil predominance. And infectious screen should be negative. Uh, bacterial cultures, serology. And uh, if puncture is performed, uh, the pus should be uh, negative for uh, mycobacterial fungal, uh, pyogenic, as well as parasitical investigations. And antibiotic failure defined as uh, standard treatment with uh, IV antibiotics for at least two weeks. And also if anti-TB drugs given for at least uh, three weeks of, uh, uh, three months of anti-TB drug failure. And uh, the la last criteria is actually retrospective finding a rapid response to steroid as shown in uh, our patient. So this aseptic abscess syndrome is common in young males. So it can occur as an isolated clinical entity as well as commonly it is associated with underlying uh, other inflammatory diseases. So among those inflammatory diseases, inflammatory bowel disease is the most common associated condition. Apart from that, most of the rheumatological conditions including um, neutrophilic dermatosis, uh, relapsing polychondritis, rheumatoid arthritis, Spondyloarthritis, Bechet syndrome uh, can also be associated with aseptic abscess syndrome. So, what are the clinical features? There are three common clinical symptoms. Uh, those are fever, abdominal pain, and weight loss. So, this aseptic abscess syndrome has a predilection for uh, lymphoid organs as well as the spleen. So, uh, lymphadenopathy and spleen involvement can be there, and they have uh, oral ulcers, as in our patient. And uh, it has shown that the frequency of oral ulcers in uh, isolated aseptic abscess syndrome, as well as when it is associated with uh, inflammatory bowel disease, is same. And they can have cutaneous manifestations, multiple cutaneous and subcutaneous abscesses, paniculitis, and pyodema ganglionosis. Apart from that, uh, myalgias, arthritis, and arthralgias are the other less common reported symptoms. So imaging will show abscesses mainly located in the abdomen. The commonest site is spleen. Splenic abscesses found in 71% of the patients. So apart from that, there can be involvement of uh, extra abdominal involvement as well. And uh, less commonly, they can have aseptic meningitis, pericarditis, myocarditis, peritonitis, pleural effusions as in our patient, and uveitis, episcleritis, conjunctivitis, and rarely the bony. So investigations, they will show uh, neutrophil leukocytosis with elevated ESR and CRP, and there will be mild to moderate elevation of liver enzymes. And extensive laboratory evaluation, including cultures of aspirated material from abscesses, will not identify any infectious agent. And autoantibodies are usually negative unless it is associated with underlying uh, rheumatological condition. And histology uh, will show central suppuration with neutrophil uh, predominance with palisating histiocytes and giants. So diagnosis, essentially a diagnosis of an exclusion of an infectious causes. So it is very important to take specialist opinion from a physician, microbiologist, or an infectious disease uh, specialist uh, to exclude infective causes to diagnose this condition. That is the uh, priority. Uh, pathophysiology, not very clear. Uh, it is thought to be belong to spectrum of auto-inflammatory multifactorial disorders. 
and IL interleukin 8, uh, TNF alpha, and interleukin 1 beta thought to involve in the um, activation of uh, inflammation via macrophages, uh, whereby amplifying the influx of neutrophils. And uh, two important things, uh, the patients with aseptic capsule syndrome, they don't have any associated systemic vasculitis. And also their phagocytic function is normal. So they don't have any increased risk of recurrent infections. And uh, aseptic capsule syndrome shares many features common to other uh, monogenic uh, autoinflammatory disorders such as uh, Papa syndrome and Trap syndrome. So this diagram again shows the place of aseptic capsule syndrome within the spectrum of uh, autoinflammatory and other yeah, rheumatological conditions. So it can occur as an isolated disease entity in 49% uh, of the patient. And also it can be associated with these other uh, inflammatory conditions in 59% of the patient. Uh, the commonest association is inflammatory bowel disease. So management, antibiotic therapy is uh, ineffective in all patients. So most of the patients, 96% of the patients responded to initial IV oral steroids. So initial steroid dose can range from uh, prednisolone 0.5 milligram per kg to 1 milligram per kg. And uh, that should be maintained for two to four weeks followed by subsequent tapering. And uh, relapses have been reported in patients who have been only maintained on uh, uh, steroid therapy. So we need a uh, maintenance drug. The ideal maintenance drug and the duration has not been established. However, in case reports and case series, most of the biologics and disease uh, conventional demands have been used successfully. Out of them, uh, colchicine is the commonest drug which have been used in the treatment. Apart from that, acetylprene, cyclosporine, cyclophosphamide, methotrexate, and MMF can also be used. And uh, colchicine is the only drug that appear to be protective against relapses. And importantly, it is one of the drugs which is used in the treatment of other inflammatory diseases, which influences the migration of uh, neutrophils. So biologics can also be used for maintenance and in the treatment of relapses, and also when it is associated with IBD and other uh, rheumatological conditions. So infliximab, etanercept, adalimumab, anakinra, tocilizumab, and canakinumab uh, have been used successfully. So what about the outcome? Relapses have been reported uh, less than one year in 62% of the patients. It's a very high relapse rate. And up to seven years, uh, they can relapse. So when a patient with aseptic capsule syndrome present with a relapse, it is very important to exclude, reevaluate and exclude infections because they are on immunosuppressive drugs. So aseptic capsule syndrome has a favorable uh, survival outcome and no case fatalities have been reported directly related to the disease. However, if not identify and diagnose uh, early, it carries significant disease morbidity and prolonged hospital stays, prolonged causes of IV antibiotics, and even some patients have undergone splenectomies as well. So uh, coming back to our patient, uh, he's currently being followed up uh, as outpatient in our rheumatology clinic. Now nine months gone after the initial diagnosis, he's only on colchicine. We have tailed off prednisolone and uh, no evidence of disease relapse up to now and no other features of any associated inflammatory conditions up to now. So these are the key messages I want to highlight from this talk. So consider auto-inflammation in the differential diagnosis. So aseptic capsule syndrome is rare. So your, if you um, come across a patient like this, so your first priority is to infect, exclude infections uh, after taking uh, opinion from a, a physician, microbiologist or an infection disease specialist. So uh, when it is associated with an uh, underlying inflammatory disease or inflammatory bowel disease. And when the infectious screening is negative, when the abscesses are sterile, uh, and when they are not responding to standard management, uh, think about aseptic abscess syndrome as well, even though it is rare. So early diagnosis is important to reduce the disease uh, morbidity. So these are my references. And I would like to thank uh, my trainer, Dr. Gunendrika Kasturidatna, consultant rheumatologist in NHSA. And also, uh, Dr. Puldisa Anayaka, consultant physician in NHSL, and also the medical team, especially the, all the senior registrars and registrars of Ward 42, and Dr. Mahen Patalawala, consultant microbiologist, and also our dermatology team and our patient. So, uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jaimal.
it was an interesting case, I guess, and it was my team, so we can answer any questions that, uh, if you have. Dagmar um, has given a complete description of all the clinical teachers, management, diagnosis, and everything. Any questions? Yeah, it's a rare case, and it was the first patient we have seen in my career. And always we have considered this organic condition in this kind of a patient. It's always very, very important to exclude the infection, which should be given priority. And we are very thankful to the medical team. They have done a great job. They have excluded all the infective forces involved by the time we were involved in the management. Yeah, the dose is 0.5 milligram. Uh, uh, 0.5 milligram BD dose. You can uh, use one to two milligrams daily dose. That is the standard dose used uh, in other case reports and case series. And uh, uh, colchicine is the only drug uh, it has shown to be uh, effective in uh, preventing relapses. So all the other, uh, this uh, aseptic capsule syndrome has a high relapse rate, 60, uh, about 61% relapse rate in one year. So colchicine thought to be uh, involved in uh, influence the migration of neutrophils. That is the main pathophysiological basis of this disease. So that is the drug which have been successfully used. Apart from that, the next commonest drug is azathioprine, which has been used for maintenance therapy. Uh, and uh, in some patients, biologic also have been used, especially the infection. And also in Bishets, also. Yes. In Bishets, also, we can use. Yes. Luckily, we had uh, congestion, which is still available from our clinic for the patient. Thank you very much. Thank you.